Friends, good morning. Grace to you in peace in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's truly a joy to be gathered for worship this morning. And as our time together begins, I welcome you and uh, anyone visiting with us online this week. It's truly a joy to be gathered in the house of the Lord for worship. As we do begin uh, our time together, I have a couple of announcements to share with you. Uh, the first uh, are the names of three additional people to include on our prayer list this week. The first of those three names is Catherine Craw. Catherine lives in North Chi Lai, New York, and is a sister-in-law of Paul Johnson. So please be in prayer for Catherine. Also, uh, Morris Dix from our own uh, church community uh, is home after recovering from successful gallbladder surgery earlier this week. And a friend of our community, Ron Wise, remains in Jewish Hospital in Louisville dealing with uh, renal concerns, concerns over his kidney function. So please be with these, or include these three additional names uh, on our prayer list, or on your prayer list. We will include them in our prayers this morning. The second announcement I have is that our session meeting, our regularly scheduled session meeting, is this coming Wednesday night at 5.30. And so if you are an elder, please make uh, plans to attend that meeting. Uh, my third announcement has to do with these boxes that keep arriving more and more each week on the front pew. Dedication Sunday will be the 21st of November, and I see someone kind of raising their hand like they have a few things to say, so I'll call on Michelle Murphy to share about Operation Christmas Child. Okay, so I will still, if anybody still wants to use to do boxes, I'll accept money today. Okay, so if anybody still wants to use to do boxes, You can look no, at them. I'm you, saying, am I, I right? The 21st is a Sunday. That's the, my. The 21st we will, is a dedication Sunday, but I'm not going to be here. So I need volunteers to help take the boxes after church on Sunday. It just goes to um, the CU at their drama building, which is right behind the CVS. And all we have to do is drop them off. They're supposed to open at uh, noon. Children of the Church shopping for uh, boxes on Tuesday. Uh, donations to that effort can be made today. And, and of course, the uh, seeking of volunteers for uh, delivery of the boxes on dedication Sunday, the 21st of November. Are there any other announcements to be shared with the congregation this morning at this time? Yes. Opportunity uh, circle this Wednesday, one o'clock. Any more? Going once, going twice. All right, folks. We have uh, come from our various homes, from our various lives, and our prayer collectively is, or ought to be, that in this time, in this space, we can set aside the other matters that clamor for our attention, so that here and now we might know truly the presence of God's Spirit in our midst as we come to worship God this morning, as we come to lift our voices in song, as we come to offer our prayers, as we come to hear God's Word proclaimed, and even in this service to receive a couple new members into our fellowship, may we truly know the presence of the living God in our midst in this time of worship, and may we be led into this time as the music of the prelude helps us prepare our hearts and minds.
members at this time, I invite you to join me as we collectively participate in our call to worship. It is not enough to gather in the sanctuary made by human hands, because God is calling us to make all the world a holy sanctuary. We come in to be strengthened to go out, so that at the end of time, all creation may be ready to be born again, whole and glorious. Friends, may we lift our voices as we stand to sing our first hymn this morning, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
begin our first reading is from Psalm 127, where the psalmist writes, and the pilgrims would have repeated, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward, a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now on to our second reading, the one that Michelle mentioned we were going to talk about, where Jesus tells a story that is recorded this way. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at all banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show they make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. As we begin this morning, I invite you to take a mental trip with me to the grocery store. Say it's that time of the week. Maybe for you it's a once-a-week ritual, maybe once a month, I don't know. But say it's your big shopping time, right? So your cart, as you come to your completion of the trips through all the aisles, is a full cart. What's in it? Cereal and milk, soft drinks and granola, coffee and some of the fresh produce, maybe some healthy meats from, healthy proteins from the meat counter, including chicken and hamburgers. I don't know how you shop. Sometimes our cart looks quite different. But when you get to the end and it's that big total and you're expecting to just walk out, they sometimes ask you that surprise question. Would you like to round up for fill-in-the-blank charity, right? Would you like to round up? kind of catches you off guard, you know, are they going to round up dollars or ten dollars or to the next hundred dollars, you know, they, anyway. This approach, would you like to round up, is an increasingly popular approach, and it's increasingly popular for some very good reasons, not just done at grocery stores, some restaurants do it, some uh, merchants of any uh, variety of stripe will do it, and one of the organizations that uses this sort of approach, this is kind of where I'm going with talking about rounding up. One of the organizations that uses this approach is Goodwill Industries. Their program is called Change for Change. Catchy title, right? And as an example of how effective this sort of program can be in Fort Worth, Texas alone, shoppers raised more than $295,000 across 25 retail locations in the calendar year of 2020. Yes. One year ago, 2020, $295,000 raised through Would You Like to Round Up sort of programs. And these programs, or this program, advertises you give change and we will promote change. And the 
change that Goodwill Industries promotes is change like job training for people with barriers to employment, possibly adults with autism, things of that nature. And Goodwill Industries, as well as other businesses, understand and are coming to understand more and more and more the power of a penny, just one little bitty penny multiplied over Elena Redmond, does that name ring a bell? She is someone who recognized the power of the penny. In fact, wrote a book by that title, her book entitled The Power of the Penny, subtitle Abraham Lincoln Inspires a Nation, is a primer about the penny that not only provides principles for how to use and spend money, but it links the penny to the U.S. president whose likeness is on it, obviously by a name. And the audience for her books is children. So these kids get lessons in history, lessons in culture, and lessons in economics. Understanding the power of a penny. And at this point in time, you might be asking yourself the question, why is the preacher rambling on about a coin that will be phased out of our U.S. Treasury by April 1st, 2023? Maybe you did or didn't know that. But here's why I'm talking about when we look at ourselves, when we assess ourselves before God and before our neighbors, when we take a spiritual inventory, if you will, I think it's a good and healthy exercise to think about the penny philosophy, quote unquote, by which we live for each of us, for everyone. From time to time, we ought to challenge ourselves to review how specifically we view and manage our monies and review the principles that guide us rather than just blindly going through life spending out of habit or out of routine and when we review our pin pardon me getting tongue-tied when we, we review our penny principles I didn't realize I was going to give myself a tongue twister when I wrote that when we review our penny principles we need to keep a few things in I want to review just a few penny principles before we get on with our conversation about the scripture this morning. The first thing would be in dealing with penny principles is the same thing that happens in all of life. The penny, like the dollar, like the tree, like all the earth, it belongs to God. First and foremost, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let's not forget that. That's a basic principle for all of life, and it trickles down to the pennies in our possession. The second principle would be that the penny alone by itself is powerless. It is only a piece of copper. Actually, in our world now, it's copper and zinc. If you were to weigh it on a scale, it's going to come in at a mere 2.5 grams. And you can find them out and about, laying on streets. People walk past them anymore. That lucky penny has, I think, become a lucky dime in terms of the economic impact. You can find them in piggy banks and jars and pockets and kitchen drawers. All around uh, places where people are given change, a lot of times they just drop their pennies. When I was in college, and this is a while back, I'm not going to name the number of years to date myself, but the... Uh, woman at the cashier's office when I was cashing my check for working as a resident assistant asked me just out of curiosity what I knew with my change and I said I throw it in a jar to pay for gas on spring break and she said well I'm glad somebody does something with that I've been asking students and they just say it we throw it away we throw it away anyway just on its own one penny can do very little but here's the thing if you pick it up and he has no power without a person to put it at work. And so if you make plans for your pennies and put them together and put it to work, you can make the money serve you by going towards an agenda you would prefer, not just being less left loose on the ground. And so you put together a vision of how the pennies multiplied can work. And if you don't, the penny is just that individual piece of loose change that so many people ignore and leave alone. A third penny principle would be not to bow down to the penny, that is to say, not to love money. 
no need for us to make it an object of lust in our life. Money and the love of money can sometimes be more trouble than it's worth. A celebrity that I don't quite quote often, maybe I've never quoted in my sermons, is the late Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> Familiar with the Notorious B.I.G.? Well, he's got a song entitled, No Money, No Problems. And in that song, he says, I don't know what they want from me. It's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. Notorious B.I.G. is on to something that all of us have realized in life. Sometimes money and the love of money only is accompanied by more problems. A fourth penny principle would be not trying to please the penny. Uh, and by saying that, I mean don't worship the penny. Worship God. And remember Jesus' words. Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. That's Luke chapter 12, our chapter of reading today, but in verse 15 prior to the verses we and to this idea, if we turn to Hebrews chapter 13, we would find there the writer of Hebrews adding this thought, saying, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Two more penny principles. Fifth is don't pinch a penny. I mean, two more. Uh, this is the fifth in my list. I realize that might have sounded strange. We've already covered four, so we get to number five, and there will be a number six. But number five is do not pinch the penny. Don't be parsimonious with how you use it. Rather, be generous. Give generously. Give it away to strangers. Give it away to charity. Give it to the church. Keep what you need, but give the rest away for goodness sake. The sixth principle, and I'll move on to our scripture, is do not fear poverty. God promises to be our provider, Jehovah Jireh. And for us, giving away our pennies will not make us poor if we do it with wisdom, if we do it with God's direction. After all, there's a bumper sticker, I think, that says the one with the most toys wins. And we all know that that's not true. But the same could be said about a bumper sticker that says the one with the most pennies wins. Not true either. The ones with the most pennies simply have the most pennies. But we all have the same destiny. Beyond these ten principles, I want to get back to our reading this morning. And when we come across and encounter this, we get an interesting picture. When Jesus took up a position to watch people putting in money in where they received the offering. And he watched this widow following in line of all these people that had given big gifts. And he Watches her fumbling around in her change purse for the last two coins she possessed. And he was curious about it. <coughs> he called his disciples, his students, over to watch what had happened. And as they take in this view from a distance, her two coins are announced to have amounted to only a few pennies, or only a penny. And he and the disciples watch her drop that, the remainder of her possessions into the collection box. Knowing her situation, knowing she is not just one of those next door millionaires, but truly a person of need, they were amazed. Her bank balance just went from one to zero. Jesus was impressed by this. Jesus was highly impressed by this, especially since she he had just watched the rest of the people putting into the collection big gifts that truly didn't amount to really anything. But these were the people who had, in the way they operate, been
been the ones who oppressed the poor widows in the first and foremost place. Their abundance, their abundance came from motivations and practices that kept her where she was. We're not, familiar, not sure if you're familiar with the name Raylan Givens. It's a character from a TV series called Justified. He was a U.S. Marshal, and he would have classified this possession as ill-gotten gain. They had what they had because they were going about doing the business of the temple in a fashion that was not intended to be. But this woman, on the other hand, she worshipped God with the two coins that she possessed, all that she had. And Jesus was inspired and said to his disciples, truly I tell you, she, this poor woman, has put in more than all of those who have contributed to the treasury. All of them have given out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything. That widow's, widow's two coins, that widow's penny power, gave the power to inspire even the Son of God. As we've often heard it said, inspiration leads to change. Delani Uswad is a principal at Rocky Ridge Elementary school in Hoover, Alabama. And according to a recent article, I think it was 2020 of last year, um, she is a master of leadership. Dr. Dill, as she likes to go by for the students and teachers in her charge, has a motto. Her motto is, take time to inspire and be inspired. And she thought of the penny, the lowly penny, and in her life and in her creative thinking capacity, she encouraged everyone at her school to offer a penny to anyone who inspired them. She asked the penny giver to say to the one receiving the penny, you have penny power. You inspired me. And I hope you take this penny and pass it on to someone else. It was kind of like paying it forward, but in an inspirational sort of sense. She was more than surprised when it caught on in a broader sense than she imagined. Uh, kids began starting bringing more and more pennies to school, and the Forbes article quotes her as saying it was so moving they were giving them to the teachers as well as the students, and they were telling their teachers how much they appreciated them. They were giving them to the student aides. They were giving them to the custodians. They were giving them to their parents in the parking lot. It was like a love starting with the inspiration of a lowly penny. Again, it produced inspiration and now generated change in the way the school's mentality was. The students began to focus outwardly, and the penny project began as a means of sharing respect, acknowledgement, and inspiration in the community, but it grew in a movement in that sense to a changed or improved culture which promoted civility and compliments. So from inspiration to change, the power a penny has. And in the case of the widow's story from today's reading, it was not the penny itself that inspired Jesus. It was the faith, the faith she displayed that motivated the giving of her last two coins. She knew God as her provider. And Jesus was always impressed when people expressed their faith in outstanding ways. In fact, nothing moved him more. And the lack of faith was what often distressed Jesus. But this widow's offering was an expression of faith and of her discipleship and devotion that Jesus found utterly impressive and inspirational. has the power to be inspirational. It has the power to bring about change. And it has the power to express faithfulness in some outstanding ways. Again, often used as a stewardship sermon, uh, I'm not necessarily addressing it so, though it's not, not a stewardship sermon. Jesus, in his life, though, often talked about money, and this is the story we encounter this week as we follow our pattern of reading along in 
lectionary text, a three-year cycle of reading through the scripture in its various books and forms. So this is ultimately a story simply of discipleship. And yes, discipleship involves stewardship. But more than that, the story of the widow's might is a story of a faithful person being open and willing and humble and ready for God to use her. And as such, it should inspire us to be people who are open and willing and humble and ready for God to use us. I grew up as a child of the 80s. Yes, back when mullets were popular the first time. I believe they're making a resurgence. And yes, little Jimmy Murphy tried to get the barber to cut his hair and what I could assemble into a mullet. Right? But there was a, back in the 80s, in addition to my mullet days, uh, there was a band called Jeff Moore in the Distance that uh, was a Christian rock group, and I listened to them endlessly back on these things called cassette tapes. Remember those? And my cassette tape would often get to this song on the Jeff Moore in the Distance cassette, and the lyrics of this song, entitled Heart and Soul, go this way, at least skipping down to the second verse. I passed a church one time where a rich man filled a plate, but he gave just a little of what he had. But an old woman that nobody saw, she didn't have much of anything. But the little she had, you know, she gave. Because she knew God said, I'm giving you two hands you can call your own. Two feet to lead wherever you want them to go. Two eyes to see things you want me to know. Said, I'm giving you everything. Everything, heart and soul. song then has a bridge that says be it little or much what you have is going to be enough you can praise him be it great or small a little love can break the wall between us and in its 80s style of high electronic kind of synthesized kind of music that song played again and again in my mind and it reminded me of this story of the widow's might that we read today, which gives us a chance to review our spiritual view of and priorities for our use of money and how we use all the resources of time and talents and treasure that God provides for us. How do we respond to a God who gives us everything, heart and soul? Be it little or much, what you have is going to be enough. You can praise him. Be it great or small, a little love can break the wall between us. So, friends, it is this morning that, yes, we come to understand again and again, or we come to understand this morning again, I should say, that our gifts to God, our meaningful gifts to God, through charities, through churches, through personal channels, demonstrate the power of of inspiration, change, and faithfulness that God knows are within each and every one of us. Amen and amen. Now as our worship continues, will you join me in the rec uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed? Together may we state our beliefs saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. <laughs> Amen. Friends, will you at this time join me as we turn our hearts and minds to a, a moment of a season of prayer, and may we begin our prayer time together with a moment of personal silence. Let us pray. Lord, 
hear our prayer. And from our moment of silence, we thank you for hearing and responding to the concerns that we have. Lord, we thank you for making us, for making us for your own purposes, for calling us to be your people, your covenant people, for calling us to be set apart. Lord, and we know that we are set apart, not for the sake of our own personal privilege, but for the sake of service to your kingdom. We know that we are set apart, not for special rights and privileges, or responsibility to serve others with humility. Lord, as we bow before you today, may we express that our loyalty is to you first and foremost, to you and your kingdom. Our values, our priorities, our pursuits, our passions are all designed to reflect your heart, which is a heart of love, love for all, including the poor, a heart for justice, a heart for those who are on the fringes, a heart of compassion for those who are broken. Our prayer this morning is that you would transform us as our merciful Savior, that you would come and change us in those places where we are still attracted to the power and the money and the beauty of our culture's agenda and the way that they say those things can bring broad influence we pray that you would save us from serving those unworthy gods, from chasing after fleeting affections, from investing our days in the temporary rather than your eternal. Lord, we thank you for the call to be yours and for the grace to live out that calling. And so we pray that you would bring us to a place where we can know your grace and your mercy, where we can become channels of that grace and mercy, and where we can become reflectors of the light of your love. As we think of others now in our prayer, we pray for our world and our nation, our state, and our local community leaders. Also, we pray for individuals close to our church family as we lift up the names of Catherine and Morris, Ron and Mary, Kara, Morris and Teresa, Terry and Ray, for Bethany, and Janice and Carolyn, Faye and Teddy, Jerry, Sue and Molly. As we pray for Gary and Frank and Sam, Tammy and Kevin, Pat and Sylvia, Michael, Wendell, Nolan and the Rudzicks, Raina and Lacey, <laughs> Debbie and Mary, Joanne and Mary Ellen. As we pray for Kay, Mary Jo, Cless, and Tammy. And as we pray for our own congregation and home presbytery, for those serving in our troops at home and abroad. Lord, for the Higbees and the Smiths, and for our up upcoming mission efforts, both in Operation Christmas Child and our congregation's Thanksgiving meal. Again, adding to these the concerns with which we began our time of prayer, we bring all of this to you. We leave all of this with you. Words taught to us by Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of we continue to worship God, may we do so now uh, with the music of our offertory. <laughs>
blessed by the amazing ways you provide for us and for our families. And with thanks at this time, we reach into the resources of our lives and return to you but a portion of what you have entrusted to us. We do this with faithfulness, with joy, and with love, but with humble hearts as well, asking that you would receive these, our gifts, for the sake of your glory and to support the ministries of this, your church. We give in your holy and mighty matchless name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Friends, as we remain standing and conclude our song and worship, our closing hymn is soon and very soon. During the fourth verse, I invite uh, Pat and Peggy to come forward to uh, come and be introduced as new members in our congregation. <laughs> publicly welcome uh, two individuals who have already been received into our church membership by the action of the session at our last uh, meeting. If you'll come this way just for our online audience, uh, look at the look at the uh, look at the camera. You'll just a little bit more this way, and you'll be on the screen. Okay, just you'll wave wave, the wave to the camera. Go ahead and wave to it. Okay, there you go. And to our present community and to our online congregation. Uh, these two coming as transfers, um, Pat from the Greensburg Presbyterian Church and Peggy from the Colonial Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Memphis, Tennessee, um, are going to be asked two questions as they come into our membership. Again, I will prompt you on the answers, but the first question is, will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry? through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, I will with God's help. I will, I will with, with God's, God's help. And will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers? Again, if so, please answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And it is with, with great joy that we receive them into our membership. I will ask you to remain at the front that congregation members might greet you here on this special morning okay. for our congregation. With that being said, friends, as you go today, I encourage you to go in peace. As you go, 
May you bear for God the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. May love and joy, patience, kindness, peace, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control grow and ripen within your heart and spill over into the world. May you share your harvest freely and lovingly with loved ones and friends, fellow humans near and far, to the glory of God our Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.